I'm going to make the pattern for the peaked cap. Okay, so how are you going to, how are you going to do that? I went from the middle of the back of my head to the corner of my eyebrow here and I left a little bit loose because it's supposed to just wrap around and that'll be half of the width of the hat. So it's nine and a half, but I'll say ten just to get a little extra. In case your head gets big? Yeah. <laughs> In case my head swells because it looks so good. So how did you who, how did you learn that? To do that. Where did you learn that? Uh, I learned this from a video with Becky Julian. Mm -hmm. She said to go right right to here from the middle of the back of your head. And uh, I also got to see some of the other patterns that the women have been doing, so that gave me a good idea too. Okay. So now what? So now I'm gonna put a little extra for him. It was really nine and a half, so I'm going to go to ten and a half. So I have a little space for sewing. And then the length. And the length is supposed to go to here, the first piece. And then there's a smaller piece around the bottom, two flaps, uh, separated in the middle at the back. So each flap will go on the bottom of one side. So I want to measure from the middle of the top of my head to about here. And I'm going to do it at the front. Because it's going to have an angle at the back. Does that look right? Out there? You've got it like right here. Is that where you want it? I think so. Maybe a little longer? Yeah, because then, because then it... And it goes here, so oh. then it stops and blasts. Yeah. So hmm. that's 11 and a half, and I'll go to 12 and a half. So why? Just in case. Oh. Uh, sewing space. And better to cut too big than too small. <laughs> okay. I'm asking you all the details because someone might want to know how to do it. That's true. So I'm going to pretend that this is the front of my head and this is the back of my head. I'm going to go about here to do this measurement. Because this line is going to be at an angle. Look at it, it's got a bump in it. It wasn't straight down. Oh. You didn't have it flattened. Okay. Is that okay? I think it's okay. <laughs> so, why is this happening? Uh, why make peaked caps? They are our traditional uh, hats for Mi'kmaq women, and uh, part of the reason why they were worn is for protection. And. Um, I think wearing one, you might be able to even feel that. I'll try it out. <laughs> oh, not just protection from the wind, but you mean protection what? Um, not in a met metaphysical sense, but in a sense uh, where you are part of something larger than yourself, which is all women, all Mi'kmaq women, and part of the culture, part of the nation, and with the honored place in that nation. That's protection. Now, now I'm going to use my super bendy ruler, <laughs> and I'm going to draw some straight lines. Everybody's going to do this? Yeah. Or they could use this pattern 
if they have about the same size head as me or add to it or subtract from it. So there's my bottom line for my height measurement. I'm just going to eye it out. Do you think that's safe? Sometimes I use something uh, if I know it's the right angle. These are smart tricks. So I'm a little bit below. And I'll just line it up with it. So it looks about So why do you, you um, besides me telling you to take the job, why did you do, agree to do this? I really wanted to make a peaked cat. Um, I really like them. They're beautiful. And uh, they're a really strong symbol of the culture. And I think it's important that we revitalize those um, aspects of the culture. What do you think it will help if we revitalize? What, what will it do for us? I think it brings us back to a point uh, where we're participating in our culture as it was traditionally. And that's something that goes along with a larger path of you know, other things that are relevant to the culture and, and living that way, which is all, you know, together represented in, you know, one part of it or all of it. When you say participating, what do you mean by, like, what, aren't we participating now or has that changed since a long time ago? Um, by, by wearing traditional identifiers, by, um, understanding symbols that we would have understood and uh, yeah I guess uh, participating for me would mean being involved in it and living it mm -hmm. in some some aspects at least. Okay so women in general in our culture are they not like where, what, what's going on that a peaked cat's going to help? Um, well, I think it helps uh, to kind of uh, solidify identity. So, um, you know, you might not wear these hats every day, but at a certain function, you would know that you are with the people where, you know, wearing the hats or, or who are identifying themselves this way. And those uh, little identifiers together, it really uh, goes a long way to, mm -hmm. to bring it back. Now what? So now I I've got to make... it's a peaked cap. So. It's a peaked cap, so now I have to make the exact right angle for the top. <laughs> so how much do I want it to peak? I'm going to kind of get an idea. Actually, angles are kind of fun that way. You seem to know what you're doing. How fun. I'm a metal fabricator. <laughs> <laughs> so this is cloth, but, you know, it's still fabrication. I also like to... I like to make patterns. Um, I don't like making the same thing twice, but I like making uh, individual um, patterns. And I guess there's not much point in making a pattern if you're going to make one. But I'm an artist, not a grass person. <laughs> so there's my half of a peaked cap. Then you have to make the other side. Yes. You can't you just use that? 
Yeah, no, I'll use this. I'll just flip it. That's allowed? I think so. Better be. Are you going to allow it? I don't know. I haven't made it. <laughs> My friend uh, Caroline Marshall, Jr.'s mom, cut out some velvet and got me white, a bag of white beads and started me off with my peach cap when about, oh, probably 35 years ago. That's and she awesome. helped me make the first, she kind of almost made the first double curve on it and said, there, and she showed me how to be, there, now you finish it. And it's still in the exact state that she gave it to me. Really? So my plan is to one day finish it. <laughs> Taught to me by Caroline Marshall, and she is a good friend. That's beautiful. I hope you finish it. Well, I think she's hoping I will. She's <laughs> probably on my back right now. Yeah, she was a beautiful person. And she had a peach cat. I wonder if your grandmother had a peach cat. I wish she had. I we really do. I don't think she did. That's Janice. I've never, I never saw it once, and I went with her to a lot of things I would have seen it at. When you think of your grandma, what do you think about? What's her name? When I think of my grandmother, Stella Paul, I think of a sovereign, a true sovereign woman. I think of uh, the royalty of my family. She was everything that meant anything. Mm. So when you're making this cap, like I know a lot of the family members of Muslim and Muslim Indigenous women and girls are making their caps to commemorate or honor their loved one. Or, yeah. And so for you, um, maybe you could tell me uh, for me, I'm a survivor, uh, so I'm lucky. Um, we weren't, I might say that my grandmother was a sovereign, I might say that she was a queen to me, but she wasn't respected that way in life, and neither was I. And uh, so I guess part of bringing those things back is giving ourselves the value that we deserve that we already have, always have deserved. So, you, you, can you t tell me that whether, you don't have to, whether you testified or not for the inquiry. So, did you have anything to do with the inquiry? I sent in a visual testimony. So, it's a seven foot tall, four and a half feet wide pastel drawing of um, the bigger picture, it's a really big picture, <laughs> um, of things that contributed to um, what happened to me that are bigger than uh, uh, the isolated situation. Um, because the person who tried to kill me, um, he was indigenous as well. He was um, a 60s school. His parents were residential school. He was adopted into a white family. His name was changed, his birth date was changed, and he was uh, abused by that family. I won't go into any further details about his life, but those are the situations that we end up dealing with as Indigenous women trying to find Indigenous partners. And those are state legislated abuses. Those are abuses that have specifically affected a racialized group in Canada. So it is a big picture and it's not the same for everybody. It is an Indigenous issue. You were able to submit a piece of art. Can you tell me how that came to be? You know, maybe not everybody knows that's one of the ways you could do it. One of the ways you could submit. I was actually, um, I had some difficulty uh, putting in testimony. 
um, and uh, part of the difficulty was that uh, the person who had the, the offender against me on house arrest was present at the um, inquiry test uh, when they were taking people's testimony. Mm -hmm. So uh, she was uh, very aggressive towards me in a way that made me feel like she did not want me there and she was kind of uh, bothering me and that just made the whole situation that was, you know, difficult to deal with presently. So I ended up, I gave testimony about um, other issues um, because uh, I have done a lot of um, protesting and uh, speaking on different issues publicly. So uh, I ended up testifying with a group for that but I didn't get to include my personal testimony, so I ended up um, finding out that I could submit visually. And I'm a visual artist, so it made a lot of sense to me. And uh, I drew a giant picture about it. And then I could include an artist statement and stuff like that. So the, how, did, how was that experience for you, drawing this? And you know, it's like some people felt a relief for in, for their testimony, for speaking about it. How did, like, what happened with you while you were making this and then submitting it? Oh my goodness. <laughs> so when I was working on my art piece for the inquiry, I was living with a friend of mine. Um, what had happened is for four years before this time, um, my ex-partner um, who had done all this stuff ended up um, missing his parole hearing, missing court for another thing that he had done since he was on parole and he was just gone. They couldn't find him. So I got a phone call that, um, that I was in danger, that they didn't know where he was and there was a warrant out for his arrest, and there still is. There's been no resolution to that. So, um, I didn't know what to do. I was parked at the side of the road getting this phone call, and then at the end of the phone call, she said, and we're going to have to put a reference into Children's Aid because it's a high-risk case. Nothing to do with me or my children, just because it was a high-risk case. And the only thing I could think of was no. So I said it, and then I had to back it up. <laughs> so I told her, no, you don't have to do that. Because I'm going to go home today, I'm going to pack us three bags, and no one will know where we are by supper time. So I did exactly that. And then we ended up staying on the reserve that we were living on for um, eight months, living with other people and other families. And that was apparently fine with Children's Aid. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that's what we did. And um, when I was working on the drawing for it, I was staying with a friend of mine. We had both been volunteering at the Jane Paul Center in Sydney, which is a Native Women's Outreach Center. And um, she's a beautiful woman that I'm, I was so happy to meet. And she just opened her house to me and my sons, my two sons who were living with me. Um, I have two older kids too, but I had two living with me, uh, younger, and um, so we were living with her when I was working on this drawing, and she'd come in, she was like really excited about it, she'd gone through things herself, like I, I think most of my friends on reserve have gone through things and could have testified, but didn't necessarily know they could, or you know, didn't make it there to do so, or feel like could be self-included or whatever the reason is, but you know, there were a lot of people who probably could have testified and didn't, and um, you know, whatever came out of it is probably a pretty good picture anyways. But um, she was really excited about it because she knows what women deal with, indigenous women, and um, she saw 
you know, what I was working on and what I was trying to say from the picture. So I had it spread out on my floor because she had a, a nice size house and my sons had a room and I had a room. And there was like just enough floor space to roll out this big piece of paper on the floor. And I just walk around <laughs> it. And um, she'd come in every day and she'd just bust in my door and, and she'd get really excited about what progress I'd be making. And um, that, that uh, is kind of how it got made. So I had had PTSD before then and every time someone walked in a door I'd jump, I'd just jump and <laughs> she just didn't care <laughs> but she was so uh, happy and living there was so wonderful that after a while I realized when she'd bust in the door and come like look at my drawing I wouldn't jump anymore. I was healing mm -hmm. and um, a week before I had to go to the closing ceremony of the Missing Mur Murdered Wh Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry, I got a knock at the door at about 10 a.m. I had sent my kids to school, I was just about to have coffee, clean up, do some invoices, and all of a sudden there were people at my door with moving trucks and RCMP outside. My a uh, friend who we were living with, she was taking a course. She was about uh, two, two weeks away from finishing her course, or maybe it was even less time than that. But uh, she was uh, in town to uh, attend her course, and um, I was the only one there. And they came with an eviction notice, and they said, we're not leaving until everything's moved out. No one knew. So that's how evictions can go on the band. They have no eviction policy to make it any other way. They have no, they haven't put restrictions on themselves that say they need to give you 24 hour notice or two weeks notice or a month notice. No, they can show up with RCMP and a moving company to take all your things out. And that's what they did. And uh, there was nothing I could do about it. It wasn't my house. They uh, called the RCMP on her in her class and sent her, said she was suicidal and sent her to the mental hospital. And so by the time she returned, she had to talk her way out of that to tell them, you know, no, I'm not crazy, I'm not suicidal, I just need to get <laughs> my house and deal with this. By the time she, by the time she proved herself it, to go deal with it, her house was boarded up and all her things were moved out. So that was a week before I was supposed to attend the closing ceremony for the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women Inquiry in Ottawa. In Ottawa. And uh, so I, I did, you know, that's, that's what our women go through, that's banned violence against women. Um, because after that, uh, there were, I think, 11 more evictions, 15 evictions total, something like that. Not all women, but a lot of them were. A lot of them were women who were working on their lives to get children back and didn't, weren't given those timelines to even make that possible. Um, and uh, like in our situation, um, they said that she wasn't using her house. There was no partying. There was no nothing. She, they didn't check to see if she was home, you know, certain days or anything like that. They claim she had a boyfriend she was living with that, you know, she had been living with for two years and she'd only been seeing her boyfriend for five months. So after that, I realized they really weren't going to listen to any kind of truth about anything. And, and uh, that's just how it went. Since then, um, I, uh, I've been dealing with a lot of um, difficulty from that. It's really hard for people to lose their homes um, with all those memories, memories of family members and children and hopes, hopes to get that back, hopes to create a better life that is manageable and um, yeah, it's a lot of 
a lot of answering calls. So, what happened to the painting? So I delivered the painting to but Ottawa. It it's a drawing. When the police came. Was it done yet? Oh yes, when the police were there and I had to roll up that drawing <laughs> and find some way to put it at the top of my car with all my stuff that I didn't want thrown onto a truck. I had a storage space just by coincidence, so they, they ended up doing one run just for me to my storage space and I filled my car up with all the things I didn't want them to touch because they threw my hand drum in the back of the truck. <laughs> I was like, don't you know how to handle that? <laughs> Hear me, Gwaman? I told them right off. <laughs> and, I think uh, the kids went there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, they, they came home for lunch and there was no kitchen table. But <laughs> we survived it. <laughs> um, yeah. So I ended up having to go to Ottawa. But the painting was finished yet? It was finished enough, yeah. Mm hmm yep, it's finished. And did you bring it with you? Yep, I had to dig through my storage space and roll it up again, and it was just in garbage bags. On the way to the airport, I had to buy, go to Staples and buy two giant tubes and get duct tape from the dollar store next door, and I rolled it up on the huge floor space in the Staples. <laughs> and uh, put one tube on each end and duct taped it and it was ready to go. <laughs> and I was ready to go. And I had almost no clothes because I couldn't find any of my, you know, and I had to just dump everything in bags and I didn't have a chance to really go through things. So yeah, I packed a little bag and thinking it'd be warm in Ottawa, <laughs> threw my drawing on a, in a tube in New Glasgow on my way from Cape Breton to the airport. And uh, that was it. I got there. <laughs> the Mi'kmaq, Mi'kmaq way of traveling. Garbage bags and duct tape. <laughs> yeah. And will. <laughs> Determination. <laughs> so finally, the, the whole process of the painting, how did that go for you? It got delivered. Yeah. And for it was you. done. Um, for me, I. I, uh, it was healing for me, really, like even through that whole thing, you know, that drawing said it all, and I was still going through it, but at least that drawing said it all. <laughs> and where is it? Uh, now it's with the collection, the uh, art collection for the inquiry. If I want to go see it, where is it? I'm not sure, because uh, I think it would just depend on the roaming exhibits of the inquiry yeah. to to be able to see it and they might be doing something about putting them together to be accessed some other way i'm not really sure so when you said a lot of other women didn't and should have or could have didn't know they could have mm -hmm. um i already know part of why that happened but could you tell me um, it was missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and LGBT? Yes. And victims of violence. Yes, and the victims of violence was added later on. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what did that do? What, why then? Do you think that had anything to do with why people weren't coming forward? Where uh, it, was, it was exclusively for family members at first and then it was opened up to victims of violence as well and i think maybe the time between when it was opened up for victims of violence and uh the time of the um state testimony taking was uh a bit brief for people who um are still surviving. Yeah. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cut enough materials so that people can make their own patterns and then fit them into what I give them. Enough paper and cloth or enough of that this material. this stuff. That's material. And this stuff. Okay. 
and this stuff. This is the velvet for the red caps. Mm -hmm. And this one for the black caps. So the red caps are for women of childbearing years. The black caps are for women who have already matured through those years. And what about the bottom part? What color is that? The bottom part is traditionally red. And is it going to be that red or something? I think we'll have enough of this fabric to do the bottom flaps as well. Right. So for now I'm just going to flip this one and leave some room. Right. I think I can put two of them on here. Pretty much. I don't think anyone's going to be right to the hemline. So. I'm thinking that's going to be okay Four. for two sides. So I'm not going to cut them in half. I'm just going to make sure there's enough material here for both halves. That should be enough for everything. So how long has it been for um, That's a very, very you started your group last yeah. week? Yeah. Yep. How, what was that like? It was nice. Mm -hmm. With the triangles. Um, yeah. I've seen even we, had, we had a really nice time. I think it was a, a good meeting and we had a nice talk about uh, Really the double curve and the um, traditional meanings of it and uh, got into um, talk about the dotas that used to exist on our territory here and that was really interesting and um, maybe possibly including that kind of idea into our commemoration piece. So it was a good conversation with them. They liked the idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really a nice meeting. Um, just kind of getting into it and into things and um, making sure we're clear on, on the project and where we want to go with it. Uh, not to have you know, precise things laid out and every idea concrete yet, but where we're, um, our direction is heading. So what are you thinking about for your design? Have you thought about the design at all and why, what, what it, if you have, what's I, it about? I love how um, the peaked caps would represent uh, how many children you've had and, and um, mm -hmm. how uh, like even the double curve on them represents um, like the flat bottom represents an ocean going canoe and the curvy bottom represents a freshwater canoe and so that has to do kind of with what part of the territory you live on right are you coastal or inland and you know how many kids do you have it's, it's kind of fun to think about those things and a hat being so symbolic of the details of your identity. So that's where I'm going. I'm going to try and say as much as I can about myself and these double curves and stuff like that. How many? So you, do you feel you have a bit of a challenge with the mixture of uh, family members that you have? Because most of the groups have Mi'kmaq. They're Mi'kmaq and we're doing it in Mi'kmaq territory. But you have women from different parts. Where are they from? I have one Inuk woman in our group and one Cree woman in our group. And um, the Cree woman is going to be making a peaked cat with us. And um, she's going to be making it for her daughter, who she's raising on Mi'kmaq territory. And she's pregnant. Oh, is she? I didn't know. <laughs> okay. And her daughter's part of Mi'kmaq. So I think that's wonderful. And um, then 
but our Inuk friend is going to be making a traditional hat or hood from her territory. So that's exciting. And I'll try, I'll have to research that a little bit, but she'll probably know more than I do about it. And she is sourcing a pattern, so we'll, uh, we'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so now look. Um, now I've just realized I'm missing <laughs> probably two more sheets this size. But that's okay, because I'll get them. At least you had a little rehearsal or yeah. run, a dry run through before yeah. they show up. Knowing that they are going to show up sometime in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. I probably could have made more, but then there's the bottom part too. So I want to make sure we have enough for that. And so what color is yours going to be? I was thinking about blue, mm -hmm. but I haven't gotten material yet. Mm -hmm. So blue, is that one color that they use? Yeah, blue is an alternate color. And I'm not quite sure what the blue symbolized or if it was just a different um, cloth that they would use other to red. I think the traditional colors were red, black, and like a navy blue. And um, I, I even wonder if that was to do with uh, the British and the French, and then maybe black was just kind of... <laughs> well, I think some of the material there is well. surge. And that surge material you often saw in the British uniform. So it might be. Yep. Definitely might be. So it's a bit flimsy. How does it stay stiff? So once we get um, these cut down a little bit, the pattern will go on here, and uh, I have some carbon paper here, I have some graph paper here, and so um, I have some tracing paper somewhere, and so these are to work with the images, to get the images down to transfer with the carbon paper onto this, which is uh, the interfacing. So this will have like a line design on it from the carbon paper. And then this irons onto the back side of this fabric. And once it's ironed on, it will give it a little extra support because it'll, it'll keep that with it. So, um, yeah. And so the carbon yeah, stands up. Will draw onto the hat. Will leave markings on the on the. No, nope. it'll just be on this, and okay. it'll be stuck to the inside. Okay. So then people will have to kind of each stitch remember how to get back onto those lines that are on the inside. Okay. Which we'll see as they begin to make their hats. Right? Yeah. Hmm. So it'll be a little bit sturdier than this once this is ironed on. Mm -hmm. And also I think um, we'll have some ribbon to put around the hem, which might help. And the hems too will help give a little more um, stability. It's beautiful. It's it really is. Mm -hmm. Then, did you say they, are they all beading? Are they doing other things than just beading? Uh, I left that completely open because I was kind of excited to see if there would be any any other uh, additions to it. Because mm -hmm. I think from what I've seen, um, pictures of them that I've seen, I think uh, that they're really quite versatile. Like at one point they weren't really beaded so much and, and then it be was more of a serviceable thing where you were saying, who you were and about your family, and that's that's important. But um, then it became kind of uh, like there was a competition or something where um, priest. yeah, there was a, a priest who made a competition to see who could do the most elaborate beating on a cap, and and so uh, 
that kind of open things up, but then there's also been ones that have no beading and just have kind of, uh, you know, in interesting things done with them. So I think really it is open to anyone doing what they feel, which is fun because there was one I saw with a little poof of feathers and uh, someone from the group was like, I want a poof on mine. <laughs> Yeah, you can <laughs> we'll figure out how to do a poof. <laughs> an old one? An old hat had a poof? Yeah, I'm not sure how old. It might have been last century. Yes, beautiful yeah. one at the museum. That, oh, it's just beautiful with your brown feathers on it. Yeah. Well, very good. So, oh. once that's done, once they beat it, then they sew it all together? Yeah. I think that would be the way to go, is to beat it and then sew it. You just ripped your hair. I did. That's it. <laughs> Good. So then it's done. Then what happens? You wear them or a fashion show or what? Oh, know. that would be fun. Yeah. Selfies for sure. <laughs> fashion show. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about the the next couple things you have to do with this group? You're gonna on you're doing ongoing hat making. Yes, we're going to be getting together, hopefully, to beat these hats weekly, and um, at the same time, we're going to be discussing a commemoration piece for the city. Um, we we're in Halifax, Jibuktuk, and. Um, so there definitely should be something here to uh, commemorate the women who have been through here and who, um, who have gone missing and been murdered. So um, there are cases that we know of that are, are here. There are cases um, whose uh, family members live here now. And there's also women who probably have gone missing before we really were thinking about keeping track. And from these hats, we'll be making a coloring book um, to uh, also commemorate, but uh, to educate as well, um, to keep, keep uh, people in the understanding of what MMYWG uh, means, is about, and um, to uh, bring light to not just the individual stories, but also um, which are important, but to um, continue to uh, call for respect for women and to continue to um, solidify and uh, nurture the importance of women in our society, Indigenous women. Yeah, see, there's all the... Cool. And then yep. women on the bottom. Yeah, because it doesn't have to be strictly traditional. Just, uh... Well, it's whatever... Meaningful. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's something your own, right? Yeah. That's a possibility. I could do these all day. <laughs> It literally has the ill news symbol in the middle. Yes. Black will go with a lot more outfits. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>